begin by calling the roll of Plum Committee members. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Councilman Marquise Harris Dawson. Present. Uh, Council Member Gilbert Cedillo. Uh, Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Blumenfield present. Council Member John Lee. Present. Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez. Here. Uh, that's uh, four members of, oh, I see Councilman Cedillo. Present. Uh, that's five members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Mejia. For today's meeting, we will first start by taking public comments on individual agenda items, multiple agenda items, and general public comments. Our goal is to get to as many speakers as possible. We will then move through the agenda one item at a time, listen to staff presentations, and deliberate on those items accordingly. There are additional uh, rules for public comment that I'll ask the city clerk to read into the record now. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-5252 and use meeting ID number 1616 pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star nine to request to speak. During public comment, city staff will call on members of the public by the last four digits of their phone number. By pressing star nine, callers raise their virtual hand to request to speak. Once a caller hears the last four digits of their phone number, an automated Zoom voice will ask the caller to press star six to unmute themselves when it is their turn to speak. Once a caller is ready to speak, they must state their name and the items they are calling to speak on. Failure to do so will result in the call being muted and subsequently disconnected. Appellants and or their representative and applicants and or their representatives will be allowed to speak for a total of three minutes per side unless otherwise noted by the chair. Members of the public wishing to speak on one agenda item only shall have an opportunity to speak for one minute. Appellants and applicants will be given an opportunity to speak when their item is called. Each appellant and applicant has a total of three minutes to speak. An appellant can choose to have a single representative speak on his or her behalf or divide the three minutes among his or her team. Anyone else, including an attorney or project manager, wishing to speak on an appellant's behalf who does not do so during this three minute period, may offer a minute of public comment whenever the committee chairperson opens a public comment period for the meeting, which is usually at the beginning of the meeting. Therefore, we expect that appellants and applicants have their respective teams assembled and ready to present at the appropriate times today. Members of the public wishing to speak on more than one item shall state that and shall be allowed to speak for a total of two minutes. Failure to raise your hand to speak in a timely manner before the comment period for the item ends results in forfeiture of the opportunity to participate in public comment for the item. Madam City Attorney, please provide additional guidance on public comment. Terry Kaufman, Macias. Um, before I do that, um, uh, Armando, when you were giving out the phone numbers at the beginning of your presentation, it was cutting out on my speaker and for a couple of other people too. Can you just repeat um, the beginning of what you said about the numbers and calling in? Yes, Madam, Madam City Attorney. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-644-6631 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Okay. Um so um, when speaking on, this is Terry Kaufman, Messia City Attorney's Office. When speaking on agenda items, you must be on topic. Um, as the chair said, the goal is to get through all the speakers. If you're not on topic, or if we can't tell whether or not you're on topic, uh, uh, then uh, we will provide you with a brief warning. If you do not immediately and clearly return to the topic, or if you continue to uh, stray off topic and disrupt the meeting, you will forfeit the rest of your time and we will move on to the next speaker and you will be informed when your time is up. Um, I do have a question for the chair about amendments 
to items on the agenda. Um, I understand planning has an amendment for item four and I have one for item nine. Uh, yes, I believe that's the case. And Mr. Chair, there's also additional recommendations by CD 11 for item two. And I can read those for the record if that's okay with you. Yeah, so let's go through all of those and get those read, read into the record before we open for uh, any public comment. Uh, for okay. I, oh, go ahead, Terry. Go ahead. Oh, okay, My, mine is very short. It's for item nine, the, um, the restaurant beverage program. And on that one, there is a, uh, an error um, in the reference to business tax registration certificate. Um, that is the correct code in the term and the um, that is the correct term in the code and in the draft ordinance it doesn't refer to that so there are two places in there where we're going to just change it to um, a requirement to obtain a business tax registration certificate that's it on that for us um. For item two, Mr. Chair and committee members, the additional recommendations by CD 11 to the motion by Councilman Bonin are the following. One, I further move that the council authorize the planning department to prepare and submit an application for the local coastal program, LCP, local assistance grant program from the California Coastal Commission offering a new non-competitive rolling grant that may assist with the development of a coastal equity and environmental justice policy in addition to any other local, county, state, and or federal grants that are intended to further environmental justice and climate resiliency efforts in the coastal zone. Two, I further move that the that should the city planning's application be selected for the upcoming grant cycle to direct the planning department to report to the council regarding implementation of the grant and any necessary authorities to accept the grant funds. That concludes the additional recommendations, Mr. Chair and committee members for item two. All right, uh, if those are all the amendments and findings and other materials that need to be read into the record, uh, we should open it up for public comment. I, I believe for item 10, if I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Chair, for item 10, we should also state for the record that additional, uh, uh, additional findings have been uploaded into the council file. Um, Terry Kaufman Macias, as well for just to note for item eight, A and B, public comment for those items will be taken when that item is called and not at this stage of the meeting. And this is Debbie Lawrence from City Planning. I have two corrections for item number four. First is a correction for language that was contained in the actions for City Council on the supplemental transmittal that was labeled as a report from Department of City Planning. This was dated 9-24-21. The reference to the 2040-2045 Regional Transportation Plan Sustainable Communities Strategy EIR was incorrect. Instead of EIR, it should be identified as the program EIR and addendum. Secondly, the applicant submitted a request for clarifying language to be added to regulatory compliance measure RCM-BIO dash two of the SCIA to specify the criteria for a qualified biologist. The proposed modified language would state, for the purposes of carrying out the project's biological regulatory compliance measures, a qualified biologist must at minimum meet the Los Angeles County Department of Regional Planning's minimum qualifications for a tier two biological consultant and will at the time that the biologist performs project activities be listed as a certified biological consultant by the Los Angeles County Department of Regional Planning. Thank you. That concludes the amendments for item number four. All right. Uh, if there's nothing else, we can go into public comments. Uh, 
on the, Mr. Uh, Chair, there actually is for item 10, just reflecting um, the amendments for item 10. So um, given that the building is no longer uh, conveying the relevance with the, to the previous use, it is uh, now a low end car rental lot. Um, it is our position of the office to uh, instead have a more appropriate site of designation for item 10, a site of de designation. Um, therefore, we're respectfully asking and recommending that the members of the Plum Committee consider adopting additional findings that have been mentioned by Roberto uh, Mejia, um, memorializing the historic events that happened on this site. Um, but again, for a site of designation. All right, so those uh, findings have been uploaded and they're part of satisfactory, Lurie, uh, part of the record, uh, Mr. Mejia? They, they have, Mr. Chair. All right, all right. So uh, can we now go to public comment on all items except for items number seven and eight? We'll hear those uh, as they're called. Uh, so if you have multiple agenda items, general public comment around issues under the jurisdiction of this committee or about a single or multiple agenda items, now is the time to make yourself known uh, by pressing star nine and uh, our team will call on you and you will be given uh, an allotted time to speak. Caller with the number ending in 4167, please press star six to unmute yourself. with the number ending in 4167. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 7504, please press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and which items you're speaking on. Thank you very much. This is on item number four. My name is Fred Gaines with the Law Offices of Gaines and Stacy. This law office represents United Broadway LLC with regard to its property at 1140 South Broadway in Los Angeles. In 2019, United Broadway received city approval for a new 139-room hotel to be constructed on their property immediately adjacent uh, to the project you are now considering. Because there is substantial evidence that the proposed project may create significant adverse impacts that are not adequately addressed in the proposed SCIA, United Broadway requests that the city reject the SCIA and require that an environmental impact report be prepared in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act. We have detailed in correspondence in the city files that the SCIA uh, that you are being asked to approve today fails to identify obvious air quality, noise, traffic, and other environmental impacts that the proposed project will have on our client's property. Any attempt to remedy these failures will require that an EIR be prepared. Pursuant to the Public Resources Code, in order to approve the SCIA. Thank you, caller. That's your time. Caller with the number ending in 8990, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yes, but I'm here for number 7 and 8. Do I wait? Hello? We're doing seven and eight individually. Uh, this is not the time for anybody wanting to speak on seven, eight, or both. Uh, you want to wait until we come to those items and we'll hold individual public comment okay. sessions. Great. I was in line. I didn't know if I should get out or not. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you.
caller with a number ending in 9561. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, excuse me, I'm sorry. My, I beg your pardon. <clears throat> My name is Shelley Lavin, and I reside at 839 South Holt Avenue. I have been here 27 years, and um, I'm, <laughs> excuse me for one second. Okay. Um, I am also president of the um, HOA, and we are very concerned that the city has failed to conduct the required environmental review for this project. There will clearly be impacts to the environment in the form of noise, traffic, air and air quality. This project clearly is not exempt. Uh, there are also cumulative impacts. Uh, there's another elder care facility, a project rather, in the final stages of the approval process, just one street over. Please hear the concerns of the community and grant the appeal. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 6311, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you. My name is Elise Swanson, President and CEO of the San Pedro Chamber of Commerce, and I'm speaking in support of Item 9 today, the Restaurant Beverage Program. I've heard loud and clear from our restaurant and hospitality community here in the Harbor area how important this program is to the future of the industry, not only in San Pedro, but across the city of Los Angeles. Our restaurant industry has been decimated due to COVID-19 and mandated shutdowns. This program will help them recover more quickly. And I would, on behalf of our over 400 members, we would like to thank you for your time on, and work on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Good afternoon, Chair Harris Dawson and Council Members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Natalie Friedberg. I'm the President of the Silver Lake Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to speak in support of Agenda Item Number 9. I've worked closely with restaurant owners in and around Silver Lake for years, and even more so during the pandemic as we've done our best to help them with resources. There were already many challenges for these small business owners prior to February 2020, but as you all know, it's become an uphill battle now just to keep their restaurants open, and many have closed. The cost and time involved for a typical conditional use permit for alcohol is yet another hurdle, one that many restaurants just can't manage. Council members, you have a great opportunity to extend a helping hand to independent restaurant owners by passing the Restaurant Beverage Program. I truly hope that you'll do so. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, caller. Peter Warda speaking on item nine. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and members of the Council. My name is Peter Warda and I'm calling on behalf of FICA, the Valley Industry and Commerce Association. We're in full support of the Restaurant Beverage Program. Um, as we all know, the pandemic continues to negatively affect the restaurant industry and restaurant owners have had to shift their operations to ensure profit is being made in any way possible. Um, as restaurants navigate the impacts of COVID-19, they need all the help that they can get. Uh, the Restaurant Beverage Program will help neighborhoods serving restaurants recover by removing unnecessary hurdles that disproportionately impact independent business owners. Other cities have implemented similar programs uh, without negative impact on their communities. It's time for the City of Los Angeles to do the same, and we ask for your support of the Restaurant Beverage Program. Thank you. Thank you, caller.
caller with the number ending in 2649. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, this is Debbie Chinsinger for United Broadway. I'm going to explain air quality without getting technical, even though GHG is considered qualitatively, it has localized impacts due to concentration levels. Oh, I'm speaking on item number four. That's the uh, South Main Street uh, Tower. Um, SAPE corroborated our findings uh, on increased, by uh, showing increased cancer deaths for adults and children. The city responded saying that the design features and compliance would reduce GHGs and impact of the The point that we're making is a health risk analysis will address localized air uh, toxic uh, air quality contaminants and those increases in concentration. At the very least, we must correct these errors. You can prevent excess cancer deaths with uh, conditions of approval that monitor compliance. It matters where the GHGs are concentrated, and there are no compliance COAs. Thank you, caller. That's your Wait time. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Sarah Blanche with the Los Angeles Drug and Alcohol Policy Alliance, calling to speak on item number nine, the restaurant beverage program. Thank you for hearing me. Since this process started in 2017, dozens of community members and members of Los Angeles Neighborhood Councils have testified to express their concerns about such dramatic change to the alcohol permitting process in L.A., this concern exists because 80% of census tracts in Los Angeles already have excessive alcohol outlet density that contributes to drunk driving, accidents, injuries, and public nuisance activities. No one is saying the process shouldn't be easier for restaurants, but what has been said is that if we're going to make it dramatically faster and cheaper for restaurants to get permits, which will add a flood of new permits and licenses and more alcohol in our neighborhoods, public health and safety needs to be strongly represented in the process. So far, measures to protect public health and safety have been removed despite promises. Therefore, the Los Angeles Drug and Alcohol Policy Alliance opposes the restaurant beverage program unless the following reasonable provisions are incorporated. Alcohol sales should be capped Thank you, speaker. at 30% That's your time. of total revenue. Hey everyone, good afternoon. I'll be speaking on item number four. Uh, my name is Danny Melendez. I'm a resident just south of here. Uh, I've been excited to follow this project and I'll continue to follow it. Uh, it's, a, it's an exciting project to see in this area. So much housing. Uh, let's approve it so that we can get this city moving. Please support this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, name? all. Yeah, good afternoon, all. I'm Gus Torres, a member of UA Local 255 Fitters, Welders, and Apprentices. And we are here to lend our support to this project. We're support supporting a project that will do much to support us, the workers in the pie trades and every skilled trade. We support projects when their developers want to see that a local skilled workforce is paid well, fairly, and gainfully employed. We support projects when they allow us to train the next generation of skilled workers in our trades so that we can pass the benefits on to others too. Please support this project. Thank you for your time and God bless. Thank you, caller. Hello, my name is uh, Sammy Onito, and I would like to speak on item number four. I live in downtown. 
at the last hearing for this project, I spoke in strong favor of this project. I heard a lot of people who live around here who also supported it. I heard a prominent businessman and his attorneys who don't want the project for reasons of self-interest oppose it. Let me be clear. The people who live around here see a building like this can go up, and we want it. This area needs more housing, a lot more housing. Please listen to us and not to those who speak from corner offices. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Hello, committee members. My name is David Juarez, and I'm with the California Restaurant Association. I am calling support for item nine, the creation of the restaurant beverage program. It has been about four or five years in the making, and now more than ever, it will play a crucial role in ensuring the survival of many restaurants. The city planning department has done a great job in taking into account stakeholder feedback and identifying obstacles that the restaurant community faces when trying to obtain a condition use permit. The purpose of the program is to help restaurants maneuver through the city's red tape and ease the process for them to be able to serve alcohol in a safe and responsible manner. So for those reasons, we urge an I vote for this item, and uh, I thank you in advance for your support. Thanks. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 8468, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, this is Yvonne Martinez Watson. I'm the chair of the Environmental and Social Justice Committee for the Sierra Club Angeles Chapter. The Sierra, I'm speaking on item number two. The Sierra Club applauds the motion to promote the concept of coastal equity and environmental justice in the city of Los Angeles. To promote this effort, we strongly encourage the city to expand its outreach efforts to environmental and social justice organizations, as well as individual stakeholders living in environmental justice communities throughout the city of Los Angeles. Such outreach must include engagement from non-English speakers, people with disabilities, and the unhoused in an atmosphere of mutual respect. The Sierra Club looks forward to further participation in this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Good afternoon, Michael Shulstone with Central City Association. Items four and nine, please. You may begin. Thank you. Established in 1924, CCA is committed to advancing policies and projects that enhance downtown LA's vibrancy and increase opportunity in our region. I'm pleased to voice our support for item four, Main Street Tower, a proposed mixed use project that will enliven downtown LA. Main Street Tower will provide much needed housing and support the city's ability to meet its arena requirement of nearly 500,000 units over the next seven years. Located in the growing fashion district neighborhood, the project will continue to bolster the city's urban core by bringing in new jobs during and after construction and locating economic opportunities near public transit. This is a welcome project from a developer who has demonstrated a long-term commitment to downtown's vibrant future. Regarding item nine, we're also strongly supportive of the rest restaurant beverage program. The new process would significantly reduce the cost and time required to open new restaurants while still ensuring businesses meet strict regulations and operate as good neighbors in our communities. We believe our best planning happens when we establish standards and expectations up front so that operators can count on a fair, objective process and know that if they play by the rules, they'll be able to move forward. Even before the pandemic, too many potential small businesses were deterred from opening new restaurants because of the risk and cost created by our discretionary process. This idea was put forth about four years ago and is needed now more than ever amid challenging economic conditions. It's smart reform and, we, and welcome relief for our most impacted industry. Please mo move this forward. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Hello, am I on? 
Yes. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is David Ewing. I, I want to speak on items one and two, but in the reverse order. Uh, I'd like to commend um, Council Members Bonin and Rodriguez for moving this uh, environmental justice um, proposal and um, and it's appropriate, uh, particularly um, in the case of Mr. Bonin, where we're getting a uh, Venice local coastal program. The Coastal Commission has developed environmental justice policies and programs. I hope that um, the council office will work closely with them and the city will work closely with the Coastal Commission on this. And I hope there'll be real public engagement that goes beyond pro forma and that uh, a lot of work will be done with the community. To number one, um, this is the city's, uh, this is a, a small lot subdivision. And uh, the city worked in reverse order on this. They took a, a, a ministerial uh, application for building permits before they took the uh, vesting tenant or track map, uh, the small lot subdivision, uh, which, is, which is discretionary. And um, that, um, that made it impossible for the city to exercise uh, its dedications because the, the, uh, properly because the ministerial uh, applications uh, do not um, don't, trigger, don't trigger the dedications. And, um, and uh, that was done before the, uh, the, the so, so that they were allowed to actually build porches into the dedication before uh, the um, before the track map application uh, was was uh, submitted. Um, this is um, this is a backward process. It's, it's improper, and it re it deprives the city of the right. To Thank use you, Speaker. That's your time. As, uh, just a quick check in. Uh, we're going to close the uh, lines now for public comment. We've got about 25 people on the line. So that takes us to about 2.55. Uh, so we will take all the callers that are on the line now and uh, we'll close uh, public comment uh, following the folks that have already called in. Uh, and that should be around 2.55. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Godfrey Ashiro Kridele. I'm speaking on item number four. Uh, we support the Main Street Tower skier approval. This is a well thought out project with lots of environmentally friendly features. I think staff has done a great job and all impacts are adequately addressed. The, the responses to all comments are thorough and well articulated, leaving no doubt that the project qualifies for a skier approval. Uh, thank you. We hope you'll approve it. Thank you and Happy New Year to all council members. Thank you, caller. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, good afternoon, council members. My name is, I'm Ray, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Anchor Church of downtown LA. We have a lot of members who live around this area and we are active in this community. We support this project all the way. If we want to take our city's plans and needs seriously, we gotta have more housing. There's no two ways about this. Projects like this that add more than 360 residential units, it takes pressure off the existing needs and add, and add many new places to live. We need this to fulfill our mission of supporting every Angelino to get into housing. This project does that. Please support this project. We thank you guys. God bless you guys. Thank you, caller. <clears throat> uh, my comments are related to items seven and eight. So it, you want me to wait, correct?
Yes, that's right. All righty, thank you. Caller with the number ending in 7666, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, I'd like to speak in support of item number 9, the Restaurant Beverage Program. My name is Eddie Navarrete. I'm with the Independent Hospitality Coalition and a member of the California Restaurant Association. Thank you for all your patience and goodwill in pushing this vital item through for our small business independent restaurant community. And thank you, City Planning, for the years spent in its creation. This has been a five years long road in the making ordinance. There is no more an important time that we look at our permit systems more sustainably. Doing more with less, creating the infrastructure for the community we wish to see, creating a less burdensome application process for decisions that are 90% of the time approved anyway. Let's encourage our restaurant community by showing them they have our support. Let's move the RBP forward now. To conclude my public comment, once we pass Plum, Please prioritize for the EDAJ committee. Thank you and Happy New Year. Thank you, Speaker. Hello, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is Brian Germain. I'm speaking as a member of Local 105 Sheet Metal Workers. I am here to represent all the members of my organization. I'm here to let you know we support this project. The developer is choosing to work with qualified and responsible contractors who will guarantee us workers and things we need to support ourselves and our families with fair wages and more. Please support the project under item number four. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sean Silva, and I'm a policy analyst at Creed LA. We are in full support of the project, as my colleague said before. When we last spoke in favor of this project, we said that in our view, the project is 100% worthy of its skia. That has not changed. Its developers have incorporated every mitigatory factor feasible into the project. And as a result of its other entitlements, it will be able to add much needed density to an already becoming well-connected via mass transit area and very, very much in need of the 363 residential units that will add to the city's housing stock. Once again, the project is fully compliant with and responsive to the SKIA's environmental impact mitigation measures. In other words, recommending approval of this item today will lend a big hand to equitable and sustainable development that is responsive to our city's needs and the needs, of course, of the neighborhood that it will sit in. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller. Good afternoon, all. My name is Desiree. And like other nearby residents, I'm here in support for um, item four. I think it's worth being here at today's hearing because I heard the last hearing had a lot of support, but I didn't get to the chance to throw mine in as well. Um, this proposed building is just right for the spot. Let me just say everyone around here supports this project and that's everyone I've talked to. Approve the SCAA please and thank you. Thank you. Thank you caller. Yes, thank you. This is Blair Beston, the Executive Director of the Historic Core Business Improvement District. And I'm calling as a stakeholder in downtown Los Angeles and as an investor in a small family-owned restaurant and a lover of my city. Um, I'm urging you to support item nine. Um, it's, uh, our restaurants are just a huge magnet for community and culture and the social fabric. They're one of the many things that make our city so special. And to address the comments that um, someone mentioned about alcohol and the dangers of it, um, I would say that 
the, the benefits far outweigh the negatives. The restaurants are the eyes and ears on the street. When you activate a street, you make it safer from other more frequent and impactful crimes. So thank you. I hope that what anything our city can do to support small businesses would be a win. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Good afternoon. My name is Cameron Benji, and I'm speaking on behalf of the adjacent property, which is the future site of the Hyatt Hotel. Um, I, I'm asking that the proposal here to be rejected because it has many shortcomings. I'll give you a very quick example. The base HU report changed several CAD defaults in ways that underestimate the impact. The HU report used construction completion year as the base year for vehicle emissions instead of the current year. They also arbitrarily increased the existing emission scenario. In turn, this underestimates the report's net increase in emissions. I'd like to point out that the health risk analysis is different than screening for a local significance threshold. GHG impacts are inherently cumulative. However, the same sources of GHG emissions that emit air pollutants they still have localized effects. These pollutants can be concentrated in an area and cause localized air quality impacts that are not adverse. Thank you, caller. That's ADA your time. Pollutant. Good afternoon. My name is Shamari Davis, and I'm speaking on item four. My name is, uh, I'm a business rep for IBW Local 11, the Electricians Union here in Los Angeles County, representing about 9,000 workers. And I want to use my singular voice to advocate for all those folks. The city needs projects like this with lots of housing and built well. But how a project like this is not value neutral. In other words, it's a matter of lot how they are built, and by whom. We members of the skilled trades are out on sites every day making the buildings of tomorrow rise up. Major projects with us on the job get built right. We get fair pay and benefits when responsible contractors are chosen by good developers. This is a good project. Let's not delay. Let's move projects forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, caller. Hello, this is Stephen Luftman. I am speaking on item number 10. I ask that you support the Historic Cultural Monument for the Crenshaw Women's Center. The building is extant. Uh, it is still there. Uh, denying this historic protection would further marginalize women and the LGBTQ community. Please support this HCM. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Matthew Hayden, and I'm here to speak on item number four. I'm the land use consultant representing United Broadway LLC. My client owns property directly behind the subject property that's proposed for the environmental clearance. My client is in plan check for a new 15-story hotel. The Main Street Project's air quality analysis didn't consider my client's proposed hotel project. The Department of City Planning's response to the comment on this matter provides an explanation as to why they think it's not required. However, the results of the project's swap HRA showed excess cancer risk to other sensitive receptors that are even further away than my client's site. The project's air quality analysis didn't list the mobile emissions generators that will impact my client's hotel project, and they changed the default inputs in the analysis. Changing the default uh, inputs is not proper, and it shows that they didn't do the correct justifications and analysis for the uh, proposed project. 
if the project had been done correctly, it would have meant a health risk analysis was needed. And at the end of the discussion, the Thank city you, should have That's just required time. air quality analysis include my client. Good afternoon, Agent Scott Fine, Los Angeles Conservancy, speaking on item 10, Crenshaw Women's Center. The proposed amendment by the council office reduces this historic cultural monument to commemoration only and no preservation of the historic building and a place important to women's heritage and LGBTQ plus community. This action will undermine the city's preservation program, resulting in an HCM in name only, which is not preservation, but merely demolition with window dressing. The Conservancy are nearly 5,000 members and supporters urge Plum to reject this. All analysis of the developers demonstrate the Crenshaw Women's Center to be significant and historic from the city's Survey LA findings, the Cultural Heritage Commission, and city planning staff. Please vote to support the original motion, recommendation, and scope of this HCM nomination. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Omar Delindo, and I am speaking on item number four. I'm a representative of local 78 plumbers union here today to tell you why we support the project. It is important for my fellow workers and I to have projects like this one, which would give us an opportunity to work in our trades and support our families. Please remember that we're members of, our, of your community. Our work is more than individual construction jobs. It's the career. Working on many, many high-profile projects over the years, we bring expertise and certified skills to make sure these projects we work on are built right. Please choose local and responsible contractors, and please support good-paying middle-class jobs in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 0824, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 5065, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Hi, my name is Donald. I'd like to speak on agenda item number 4, number 5, uh, number 3, number 1, and number 8, and general comment, please. You may begin. Uh, agenda item number 1, um, that's uh, 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 1801 South Penmar Street. Uh, if you uh, aren't sure of who the owner was or you need to verify to build that property, the previous owner uh, was Jerome Powell, the Fed chair. It, it, that was his mom's property. Probably she's gone. I don't know if he's alive either. Uh, 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 you got to ver There's more than one Jerome Powell. They look alike in the Fed. You got to you should if you need to verify that you need to ask him about that property. Make sure you get the right one. Item number three, 6817 Hawthorne Avenue. Uh, the El Capitan Theater, that building, that belongs to Disney. Disney belongs to Donald. That's my property over there. Agenda item number three. Uh, you need to look over there real carefully. Verify the address. Uh, there's some funny business. Uh, they uh, try to divide the property in the lots and they changed the address to claim they own the neighbor's property. There's a problem with that over there. Uh, the El Capitan Theater, yeah, that's Donald's property. I'm right out here. That's my property. I, you know, I really don't want, I don't really don't like those guys over there, but you know what? They shouldn't be building more on my property. Item number four, 1123 South Main Street, Irvine and Associates. Uh, these guys are playing Monopoly. They think they're playing Monopoly, trying to build the most properties. 
Uh, they're involved in some a lot of corruption, a lot of the illegal construction, and a lot of the crimes committed in real estate are committed by these guys. I don't know who the main fund associates are. Uh, the property assessor report for 1123 South Main Street, that address item number four, unverified sale. It looks like they were changing addresses by dividing lots. Uh, people are after it because it's gone up to three times the value since 2002. Uh, there's a problem. Maybe and take a look at speaker. that. I don't know for sure. Uh, and that concludes public comment at this time. Thank you so much to everyone who called in uh, to participate in our conversation. We know we'll have more callers for items number seven and eight. Uh, Mr. Mejia, we'll begin the deliberation of items with item number one. Uh, yes, item one, Mr. Chair. This is the categorical exemption from CEQA and an appeal by William Wood relative to the approval of the environmental clearance and the vesting track map for an eight lot small lot subdivision. I believe the request is to um, continue the matter, Mr. Chair. All right, that item will be continued to a date to be determined. Uh, that takes us uh, to item number two, which the chair is requesting, uh, if there's no objection from members, that we adopt on consent. Okay. Yes, and uh, as stated previously, Mr. Chairman, um, I indicated that there were two additional recommendations uh, submitted by CD11, and I've read those into the record, Mr. Chair. Excellent. So if there's no objection, we'll take those uh, items with the amendment, that item on with the amendment um, on consent, and that'll uh, move us to item number three. Item three, Mr. Chair and committee members, this is a sustainable communities project exception, uh, and a report from the planning department relative to the construction of a new eight-story mixed-use building with 137 dwelling units, of which 14 units will be reserved for extremely low-income households, properties located in CD 13. Excellent. Uh, we have a report from Department of City Planning on this item. Mr. Golden, you're on mute, sir. Mr. Golden, you're on mute. Good afternoon. Okay. Slum Committee. I am Kevin Golden, City Planner in the Expedited Processing Section of the Planning Department. The proposed project, as you heard, involves the demolition of an existing surface parking lot and the construction, use, and maintenance of a new eight story, 97 foot mixed use building consisting of a 1,207 square foot ground floor cafe and 137 dwelling units, of which 14 units will be reserved for extremely low income households. The project will provide 150 automobile parking spaces located within two subterranean levels. The project includes 54 studio units, 56 one bedroom units, and 20 two bedroom units, and a total of 12,405 square feet of open space. It is requested that the city council consider and determine if the proposed project qualifies for a sustainable community project exemption, commonly referred to as SCIPI. Pursuant to the Public Resources Code, or PRC, sections 211 I5 and 21155.1, the item before you today is only for the SCIPI as the environmental clearance. No action will be taken on the related director's level case for the proposed project. Prior to this hearing, staff received a comment letter from the Los Angeles Unified School District, which recommended conditions addressing construction impacts on air quality, noise, traffic, transportation, and pedestrian safety. Those concerns are addressed through the city's regulatory construction mitigation. However, the applicant's environmental consultant has submitted a, a detailed response to those comments, just for the record. The SCIPI was reviewed pursuant to the provisions of PRC 21155 and 21155.1. The project qualifies for a transit priority project that meets all the requirements to be declared a sustainable communities project. 
and is therefore eligible for a full CEQA exemption. Therefore, staff recommends the council determine that the project is exempt from CEQA as a transit priority project that is declared to be a sustainable community project. That concludes my presentation. Uh, we are available for questions and the applicant and environmental consultant are in attendance if there are any questions about the skidding. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Golden. Uh, if there are, uh, are there any questions or comments from members of the committee on this item? All right, uh, seeing none, uh, Mr. Mejia, if you can call the roll on this item. Uh, yes, Council Member Marquis Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Gilbert Cedillo. Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Monica Rodriguez. Aye. That is four members and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mejia. That takes us to item number four. Item four, Mr. Chairman, this is a sustainable communities project assessment. Uh, the findings, the mitigation monitoring program and the report from the planning department relative to the construction of a mixed use building with 363 residential uh, units and the project is located in CD14. All right, uh, do we have a report from Department of City Planning on this one? Good afternoon, this is Debbie Lawrence with City Planning. The item before you is a Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment, or a SCIA, dated September 2021, and a Mitigation Monitoring and Reporting Program. This is for a project consisting of the demolition of four existing buildings and surface parking, and the construction of a mixed use building containing 363 units and 12,000 square feet of commercial space in the central city community plan area. The item was continued from November 30th so that the response to comments on the SCIA could be posted and interested parties could be notified prior to council's action. And on January 7th, parties were notified of today's meeting. The SCIA was circulated for 30 days between September 30th and November 1st of 2021 and comment letters were received expressing concerns related to damages of adjacent properties in the right-of-way, geology, traffic, noise, air quality, greenhouse gases, and additional community benefits, such as requiring local hire and use of a skilled and trained workforce to build the project. A response to comments was prepared and posted to the council file management system. The comments do not provide any new substantial evidence indicating that the project would result in a significant impact upon the environment. Further, the above comments do not identify any inadequacies in the SCIA's analysis that would require revisions or recirculation of the SCIA. As such, the SCIA, as circulated, satisfies the legal requirements of CEQA and no further analysis is warranted. So in conclusion, we also recommend approval of the proposed amendments that were read into the record at the beginning of the meeting. This was one to correct language that was contained in an earlier transmittal um, instead of EIR, it should be program EIR and addendum. And then secondly, to request modified language to a uh, regulatory compliance measure for biology that would clarify um, qualifying language for the uh, uh, biologist. So that concludes my presentation and thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I will ask uh, members of the committees if there are members of this committee if there are any questions or comments uh, or if there are comments from uh, either uh, Council District 14 or other members of the Planning Department. All right, uh, seeing none, Mr. Mejia, can you call the roll? Uh, yes, Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Uh, Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Alexa, turn off the playroom lights. Uh, Council member, John, okay. Council member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and it carries, Mr. Chair. Excellent. That takes us to item number five. Item five is a mitigated negative deck uh, from CEQA, the Associated Environmental Findings, report from the Planning Commission, and approval of a resolution for a general plan amendment and a zone change for a property in CD7. Excellent. We'll first hear from CD, I'm sorry, from the planning department on this item. 
Good afternoon, member, um, council members. My name is Sarah Hounsell, a hearing officer for the new two-story, 6,006 square foot commercial office building to include six general office spaces, one medical office space, and one coffee shop on a 10,797 square foot site. The project will provide 12 automobile parking spaces at grade, 11 bicycle parking spaces. Before you is the consideration of the general plan amendment from very low one residential and neighborhood commercial to neighborhood commercial across the entire site and a zone and height district change from RE 40-1-K to Q uh, to TQ C 1-1BL-K. The project will also develop an equine trail and a public sidewalk within with street trees within the public right of way adjacent to the site. The case was heard by the City Planning Commission on May 27th, 2021. A determination was issued on July 20th, 2021 with no appeals filed. Uh, the mayor approved the City Planning Commission's action and transmitted for your consideration on October 7th, 2021. At this time, we would like to re request in concurrence with the mayor that the Planning and Land Use Committee recommend that the City Council adopt the CPC findings um, as that of the City Council, adopt the resolution for the general plan amendment to the Sunland Tahunga Lakeview Terrace Shadow Hills East Latuna Canyon Community Plan uh, to change the land use designation of the site to neighborhood commercial and adopt the ordinance for the zone and heights district change to TQC1 1 BL K. That concludes my um, summary of the project. Thank you. Thank you so much for that uh, summary. We'll begin uh, deliberation on this item for, by hearing from Council District 7. Thank you, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Uh, no, very much uh, excited about some of the uh, community amenities that are going to be created with this project, including this uh, very much needed safe equestrian trail uh, that will be contiguous in this, uh, help make this uh, contiguous and safe space for everyone. Thank you so much and uh, congratulations, Councilwoman Rodriguez and the communities of Council District 7. Mr. Mejia can call the roll. Uh, yes, Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council Member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent. That takes us to item number six, Mr. Mejia. Item six, categorical exemption from CEQA related environmental findings the report from the planning commission for the central area planning commission rather and an appeal by enrique velasquez from the coalition for an equitable macarthur park relative to the approval of the environmental clearance for a mixed-use project of 264 dwelling units 27 units for extremely low-income households in cd1 all right uh, we'll begin with the report from department of city planning Hi, good afternoon, council members. Uh, as previously stated, uh, this is an appeal of the CEQA determination for a transit-oriented communities project located in the Westlake Community Plan Area at 2401 through 2417 West 8th Street and 729 through 751 South Parkview Street. The project involves the construction of a new seven-story mixed-use development, 92 feet, six inches in height, containing a total of 264 dwelling units with 27 uh, proposed dwelling units reserved for extremely low income households. The proposed development will contain approximately 266,438 square feet of uh, commercial uh, of floor area, including 9,724 square feet of ground floor commercial space. The project will provide a total of 230 vehicular parking stalls the appeal challenges the director's determination that the project is exempt from CEQA pursuant to CEQA guideline section 15332, class 32 for infill development. Specifically, the appellant contends that the cumulative impact exception does not apply to the proposed project due to the number of past, current, and future projects spanning back to January 1st, 2018. Uh, that contribute towards the cumulative impacts of the project that must be considered. Planning submitted a response to the appeal in a letter to the council file on November 9th. As shown in the justification for the class 32 categorical exemption, 
dated November uh, 8th, 2021. Proposed project and other projects in the vicinity are subject to numerous regulatory compliance measures in the city's municipal code and state law, which provide requirements for construction activities and ensure that the impacts from the construction related to air quality, noise, traffic, and water quality are less than significant. Therefore, the Class 32 categorical exemption adequately addresses all the impacts relative to the proposed project, and staff recommends that the appeal be denied. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe we have one appellant on this item. You now have the opportunity to speak for three minutes or less. Enrique Velasquez, please press star six to unmute yourself. Hello, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so yeah, so um, I am Enrique Velasquez and I am uh, here representing the Coalition for an Equitable Westlake Macarthur Park. And yes, um, I am the appellant uh, and I will uh, <clears throat> make no more comments on the technical part of this appeal because you have uh, our argument uh, why we think that this project shouldn't go forward. Instead, I would rather talk about, you know, the socioeconomic implications of rubber stamping development of projects uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, yes, the, uh, the planner uh, that just uh, presented our argument mentioned it, mentioned it, you know, that we uh, argue that there is discrimination uh, in gentrification uh, in this uh, type of project mainly because is just focusing on the needs of people that do not live in the community. This is a massive, uh, this type of project contribute to the displacement of low-income communities, low-income families. It's basically economic cleansing and you need to address these issues because this is really taking a toll on our communities. Um, the neighborhood, Excuse me. our neighborhoods Excuse are me. getting apart. Yes. Can, can you hold, uh, Speaker, um, Terry Cobham, City, City Attorney's Office. Um, the speaker is straying from the item that is called, um, which uh, he needs to direct his comments back to this particular project. I am talking about the particular project. These, these are the cumulative effects of so many projects. I don't know what you, what what are you talking about? I am talking about the community community effects of all these projects. If you come to the neighborhood, you will see that there is projects after projects getting approved and getting built and displacing people. This is something that is happening not just in this community, but everywhere. You know, the planning that takes place here should reflect the need, should reflect the needs of our people people that already live here. What that is, is an increase in low-income housing production and not just luxury housing condos, which is what you guys are approving. This is exactly what, what I'm talking about. And this is the, the type of progressionistic community effects that taking place in our community. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, I don't think we have an applicant on the line, so we'll begin our deliberation as a committee by hearing from uh, Mr. Cedillo of Council District 1. Council member, we do have an applicant on the line for this item. My apologies uh, to Mr. Cedillo and to the applicant. The applicant uh, can speak now for three minutes or less. Daniel Ahadian, please press star six to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, esteemed committee members. I trust you can hear me. Yes. Great. I am Daniel Ahadian with Newer Development Consulting, representing the applicant in this matter. Thank you very much, planning staff, for the presentation as well as the thorough responses to the appeal point. I would like to briefly touch upon a couple of the public benefits this project is providing, and I'll focus on just two, affordability and sidewalks. The project is being built on vacant land 
that was previously occupied by commercial uses. No rent control units are being torn down and 27 affordable units are being introduced plus new supply. We set a goal for this project to create a sense of place and identity and have spent countless hours working with planning, DOT and BOE to voluntarily create a pedestrian experience that will serve as a model for future development. We're utilizing a variety of tools to create a vibrant and active pedestrian experience on 8th Street and a beautiful tree-lined landscape to sale on Parkview Street that creates a safe and enjoyable connection to the park. To do this, we dedicated some of our land to expand the sidewalk, then further set back the building on the ground floor to create the canvas to execute this vision. As such, the central APC commended our efforts with praise and unanimous approval. With regard to the appeal, the appellant's allegations and objections to this project with regard to cumulative impact are completely without merit. The project's technical studies were prepared by qualified expert consultants in accordance with city and CEQA requirements, and the project complies with all applicable zoning regulations. In contrast to the detailed set of reports in the record, the appellant's objections consist of mere conjecture or personal opinion, which do not rise to the level of substantial evidence, which is required by law. And the appellant's claims in the letter that he submitted about an outdated community plan, open space, and FAR are simply inaccurate. The appellant conflates density calculations with FAR calculations, fails to understand that the project only seeks to improve and repave the alley, and falsely claims that 22,000 square feet of open space in a project next to a park is inadequate. In fact, we can see in the pattern of appeals executed by this appellant specifically, they fashion themselves as a sort of modern day Robin Hood. Even though the affordable housing linkage fee exists, Measure HHH and countless other public policy tools that the council is implementing, they're abusing CEQA to try and usurp the role of government to impose exactions on developers. Appeals such as this only serve to slow the production of much needed housing, and we respectfully request that you deny this appeal and allow this project to move forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much uh, to the applicant. We'll begin deliberation in this committee by hearing from Council District 1. Mr. Chair, I thank you for the attention and the time that this committee has paid to all the development that's been taking place around MacArthur Park. Uh, as you know, MacArthur Park is a place that had incredible uh, glory and prestige uh, in the history of the city. Uh, it has fallen upon bad times, as they say, but it's a park that we are reestablishing and a community that we are reestablishing as a working class, low income, immigrant hub. Uh, we have several developments in the area, uh, but the first to note is the fact that uh, just recently we placed 326 unhoused residents of uh, CD1 into shelter. Uh, now we are cleaning that park. We anticipate its opening shortly. And now we are building community. Uh, this project is one of those buildings that will build community. 27 units guaranteed of affordable housing where none exists. This is low, low income where none exists. And a possibility of going up to 20%, which is our model uh, for our development in that area and throughout the district. Uh, in addition, you, you heard about the streetscaping. Uh, we are very focused on taking back this community and developing it into a, a hub of low-income and working-class people, uh, proudly, immigrants proudly, but a hub where there's uh, a lot of vitality, a lot of vibrancy. A few blocks away, we have the Mayan Corridor, which is uh, in planning and hopefully will be ready shortly. Uh, we've also, within the area, picked up a, a series of uh, e-buses to help with the traffic and the congestion, uh, to help with the environment. So this is part of a broader plan, a broader fabric. Uh, these concerns that have been raised have been raised frequently before this committee. And in all instances, they have uh, been exposed as being baseless. Uh, frankly, uh, the people who live here covet the opportunity to move into these buildings 
uh, covered the opportunities to have the um, retail and covered the opportunities for building a community uh, that's as rich and glorious as it once was. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cedillo. Uh, if there are no further questions or comments, uh, I'll ask uh, Mr. Mejia to call the roll on this item. Uh, yes, the action of the committee is to deny the appeal and sustain the determination of the Central Area Planning Commission in approving the environmental clearance um, as stated on the record by the city planner at today's meeting. I will call the roll. Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. Excellent. Congratulations, Mr. Cedillo, on the Mark MacArthur Park neighborhood. Uh, that takes us to item number nine. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, item nine is a categorical exemption pursuant to CEQA and negative DAC and errata. And the related CEQA finding is in a report and a, a city attorney prepare draft ordinance relative to the restaurant beverage program, alcohol use zone. Excellent, I believe we have reports from uh, both the planning, uh, city planning department and the city attorney's office. That is correct. You all can go in any order that you see fit. Sure, good afternoon, council members. I'm Lillian Rubio with the Department of City Planning. The ordinance before you, as indicated, is the restaurant beverage program, which was first presented to the City Planning Commission on June 25th, 2020, and referred to the Planning and Land Use Management Committee, where changes were introduced, namely the creation of the alcohol sensitive use zone version and the opt-in process. The Planning and Land Use Committee um, referred the ordinance to the Economic Development and Jobs Committee, who took final action in terms of recommendation by introducing further changes which the city council adopted. The city attorney's draft ordinance before you includes all of these changes made by the committees and the report summarizes the path it took to create the two new administrative review processes for on-site alcohol sales subject to the in-use set of standard. The intent of this ordinance is to ease regulations for small and independent businesses by creating a more streamlined process and cutting down the time and cost it takes for sit down restaurants to sell alcohol. That said, the ordinance would set up two versions of the restaurant beverage program, a general version and an alcohol sensitive use zone version, both of which would enable sit down restaurants to serve alcoholic beverages without a conditional use permit process. Um, they contain eligibility criteria to set specific rules that all participating businesses must follow and subject to more than 50 provisions, including limits on hours of operation and noise and security and monitoring requirements. The general version of the RVP is very similar to what the City Planning Commission approved with minor changes. The seat minimum was reduced from 20 to 10. The 30% outdoor city limit was removed and it would not be allowed in restaurants located in hotels. The alcohol sensitive use zone program contains all of the provisions of the general program with additional significant requirements an outreach plan to a neighborhood council, business improvement district or community organization would be required prior to the app, to filing an application and an annual alcohol sales would be limited to 45% of the total sales. Additionally, restaurants applying for the alcohol sensitive use version would be subject to a one year provisional period during which the public would be able to submit complaints through a designated complaint portal. Complaints received through this portal would be validated by the Department of Building and Safety. If a restaurant receives five or more validated complaints during this one year period, the restaurant will no longer be eligible for the program. Um, in that sense, if the restaurant receives less than five complaints, it would be available to continue in the program. In addition, the ordinance contains a number of administrative and enforcement provisions. Each time a restaurant applies for either program, the planning department would notify the applicable neighborhood council, council office, and police department. During the application process, applicants would pay an application and inspection fee submit plans and record a covenant agreeing to comply with their respective provisions. The city would have the ability to enforce provisions and bring bad actors into line. 
To help with this, all participating restaurants must enroll in the city's existing monitoring, verification, and inspections program, which consists of two unannounced inspections within five years conducted by the Department of Building and Safety. If a restaurant ranks up three violations in the form of an order to comply issued by Building and Safety or a citation issued by the police department within a two-year time frame, it would be suspended from their respective version of the program for five years and would have to apply for a conditional use permit if it wants to continue serving alcohol. For clarity, staff would like to know that this item before you is the enabling ordinance, which by itself is not applicable in any geographic area of the city. The enabling order ordinance requires opting in via resolution in order to make it active. Through this, the city council would have the ability to opt in specific geographies into a version of the RVP via city council resolution based on findings. These geographies would be able to be modified via council resolution in the future, and the city council would further be able to limit the alcohol sensitive use zone RVP in any opted in geography to beer and wine only at the time the adoption of, the of these geographies take place. That said, staff recommends that the committee find the project complies with the requirements of CEQA, which includes an errata to the negative declaration and a categorical exemption previously considered by the City Planning Commission, adopt the draft ordinance and the revised findings as presented to you today. Thank you, that concludes our presentation. Staff is available for any questions. Uh, thank you so much. Are there any questions or comments from the committee on this item? Uh, we've been at this uh, amazingly for almost three years, so I'm glad we can uh, at least see the finish line for where we're sitting uh, now. Uh, Mr. Blumenfield. Yes. Uh, well, first, I'm very excited about this. Uh, you know, obviously, with there at the beginning of this, pushing it from, from day one, I think this is important, especially with COVID. Uh, we have to support our small businesses and our restaurants, and this is a, a great way to do that. Uh, one quick question, a clarification question about the complaint system. You mentioned there's five complaints. I'm assuming that the complaints have to be validated or there has to be some sort of evidence. Is that correct? This is Maya Zaitsevsky, principal city planner. Yes, or the complaints would be validated. Okay, no, that's just important so that folks don't get concerned that a competitor could just call in five bogus complaints. There has to be uh, some validation. So thank you for that. But this is, this is great and uh, looking forward to seeing it implemented uh, throughout my district and, and this, throughout the city. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. Other questions or comments from committee members on this? I almost want to ditto my esteemed colleague, uh, Mr. Blumenfield. Uh, I will note that the um, uh, for the economy of my district, uh, small restaurants are very, very key. This is would be incredibly helpful for many of them as we emerge out of the um, out of COVID. Uh, the small Chinese restaurants in Chinatown, the restaurants in Lincoln Heights, uh, uh, the Mexican American restaurants, the whole range of of small uh, restaurants uh, throughout my district. Uh, including the very thriving corridor up in, in um, Highland Park, could all benefit from this. This could be very helpful. I think it's a prudent measure. It's it's one that does not um, really open itself up to the uh, kind of criticism that's been laid out, but more so it's a, a prudent policy that uh, is thoughtful with respect to, to small businesses and the responsibility that people will take in consuming uh, beverages. Thank you for your leadership uh, on this. I know it's been three years and I appreciate you bringing this uh, to us today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Cedillo. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, along with uh, Councilmember Cedillo, uh, I just want to thank everyone uh, that worked on this. This is something where I think all of our districts were affected uh, during the last two years, and this is something that's going to be extremely helpful. So I just want to thank all city staff for all their work on making this, and uh, thank the committee members for uh, for their no work boss. on this as well. I assembled those. Thank you, Mr. Phoenix Rodriguez. I have nothing to do. Don't say you're not on mute. <laughs> What's he saying? You're not on mute, Gil. Not on mute. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Blumenfield. And, uh, you know, as uh, as well, I obviously pay very close attention and support of my local restaurants in my district. Everyone knows uh, it's well documented what a big uh, avid supporter I've been of restaurants around this city. Um, and so it gives me uh, a lot of uh, faith in our ability to help support uh, the very industry that has been so devastatingly impacted uh, by uh, the pandemic. And I know through the, interve the interventions that we have led and my attempted interventions to help protect uh, outdoor dining uh, through the course of the pandemic uh, is one that, well, you know, they've suffered through a lot. We're trying to help uh, continue to evolve our process to eliminate the red tape and the bureaucracy to enable them to do what they do best. And that's to bring our city together at the dinner table uh, or the breakfast table. So uh, thank you to all the restaurant owners in the city for the work that you do. Uh, we're gonna continue to revise and amend our processes to make life easier for you so that you can present what you do best uh, for food lovers in Los Angeles and those visiting because uh, we love being the foodie capital of the world. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, members and uh, staff that's uh, participated in the process to bring this uh, before this committee and, and in the very near future before the full council. And then to uh, all the men and women operating uh, restaurants uh, around our great uh, city. Uh, Mr. Mejia, uh, can you call the roll on this item? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. And uh, before I do that, we're approving the city attorney prepare ordinance and the environmental clearance and related revised sequel findings. In addition, as stated for the record at the beginning of the meeting by city attorney Terry Kaufman Macias, there are going to be technical corrections to the ordinance. And I will call the roll. Uh, Council member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Bob Blumenfield. Aye. Council member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's unanimous and it carries, Mr. Chair. Excellent. That takes us to item number 10. Yes, item 10. This is a categorical exemption from CEQA and a report from the Cultural Heritage Commission relative to the inclusion of the Crenshaw Women's Center uh, located in CD10 in the list of historic cultural monuments. And uh, for the record, we had additional uh, findings uploaded uh, before consideration of this item that have been available to the public. Uh, so we'll begin with a, a report from Department of City Planning on this. Yes, good afternoon, Chairman Harris Dawson and members of the committee. Lambert Giesinger with the City's Office of Historic Resources. The item before you is a recommendation from the Cultural Heritage Commission to designate the Crenshaw Women's Center and adopt the finding that it exemplifies significant contributions to the broad cultural, economic, and social history of the nation, state, city, and community as a pioneering venue for lesbian education, health, and empowerment in Los Angeles, and a rare example in the Wilshire area of institutional development associated with the gay liberation movement. The subject property is also significant for its association with the women's liberation movement in Los Angeles and a support center for women and women's rights. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, uh, we want to uh, ask if there are comments from the property owners, uh, if you can limit yourself to three minutes or less. Alan Park, please press star six to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, Chair Harris Dawson and council members. My name is Alan Park. I represent the ownership group for this site. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. We recognize the site in building significant contributions to the gay, lesbian, and women's liberation movements. However, the Women's Center was at the site only from 1970 to 1972, as is documented in the findings. Since that time, the exterior of the building has been altered, and the interior of the building, which Women's Center members designed and utilized in a specific manner, significantly altered over the years by previous owners into a single tenant commercial space. The building is now very different from the commercial and, or my apologies, from the comfortable meeting space this 
Hunter had created. We are in critical need of additional housing. The location of the building at the site dramatically impacts the shape and layout of any potential future housing project at the site. Retaining the building would impact the livability of units, size of lending spaces, parking layout and parking access, and could result in a potential reduction of the number of what income restricted and market rate housing that could be built at the site. The building no longer tells the story of the Women's Center, but a meaningful commemoration program at the site could, and the ownership group would work with the city's office of historic resources in developing such a program. A meaningful commemoration of the building would also allow for a better housing project to be possible at the site. As such, we request the committee and council to designate the site only. Thank you. All right, uh, now we have an application, uh, a comments from the applicant for three minutes or less. Kate Eggert, please press star six to unmute yourself. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Kate Eggert, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hey, so um, hi chair, council members, Kate Eggert, uh, GHPC, uh, the nominator for the Crenshaw Women's Center. Um, when we wrote this nomination, uh, we really anticipated uh, excitement from the city for resource studies in Survey LA for its women's health and reproductive rights history and lesbian history, um, especially right now in our nation's history. Um, at this point, you, you know our arguments, you've read our nomination, um, you know the Cultural Heritage Commission voted unanimously recommending the Crenshaw Women's Center to be an HCM. Um, and you know the Office of Historic Resources supports the nomination. Um, the owner's consultant writes the, the usual rhetoric of better examples and no integrity, and unfortunately it looks like um, District 10 is in agreement. Um, this rhetoric is obviously not supported by us, and most importantly, it's not doesn't reflect uh, OHR findings um, or the uh, Cultural Heritage Commission's vote. Um, so the opposition's uh, better examples argument, um, with all due respect, there are no other examples. There's only one place that the first women's center was started. There's only one place where the first women's health care clinic was started, and that's the Control Women's Center. And um, we're not even talking yet about the gay liberation movement. Um, as for the opposition's no integrity argument um, or alternate argument, I ask you to look at the findings of OHR. They found the buildings to have the building to have good to excellent integrity. There's a major chasm in between these two. So what we're really talking about is clearing the land for a massive development surrounded by four HPOCs. Completely demoing this building is the most radical decision. And of course, other solutions can be found. So far, we've had one conversation with Alan Park, and we were hoping to continue this discussion. We're just really disappointed that it appears that that conversation is now closed. Um, we would think that all the goals of any future development and the city could be met with a creative solution with incorporating some or all of this small 1,700 square foot building into any future development. We would ask you to continue this item until we have more conversations and come up with a creative solution. And I just leave you with this. The experience of visiting a building like this, especially in some preserved state and gaining that understanding, would be so, so important. If it's demolished, the feeling and knowledge that it imparts will be lost forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Mejia. We recognize that additional information has been entered into the record. Uh, on this item. Uh, understanding that, I'll open it up for questions or comments from members of the committee. All right, uh, seeing none, I will uh, move that we improve the <coughs> conclusion um, with specific instructions. And if you can read into the record, uh, Mr. Mejia and call That's the Who fucking cares? Okay, I, I will read the recommendation, Mr. Chair to include the site, not including the building of the Crenshaw Women's Center located at 1025 through 1029 South Crenshaw Boulevard in the list of historic cultural monuments and adopt the new findings that have been uploaded into the council file. 
I will call the roll. Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member John Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Aye. That's five members and unanimous, Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, that takes us to item number 11. Item 11 is a <laughs> categorical. Uh, Egbert is on uh, mute or not on the line, please, staff. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item 11, categorical exemption from CEQA and the related findings, a report from the Central Area Planning Commission and an appeal by Daniel Cities uh, for the determination of the Central APC in approving the environmental clearance for the demolition and removal of three duplex and the construction of an elder care facility in CD5. All right, we have a report from the Department of Plan City Planning on this item. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Jonathan Hershey. I'm an associate zoning administrator with the Department of City Planning. Uh, my comments are going to mirror a January 14th uh, report that we submitted. Um, uh, this is in response to a, an appeal of the categorical exemption, the class 32 categorical exemption um, adopted in conjunction with the approval of an elder care uh, unified permit, uh, elder care facilities unified permit uh, and site plan review. Uh, in a letter dated December 2nd, 2021, the Department of City Planning responded to the appeal filed by Daniel Sidis and his representative, Joshua C. Greer of Berger Greer LLP. On December 7th, 2021, a new representative for the appellant, uh, Jamie T. Hall of Channel Law Group LLP, submitted additional comments um, uh, challenging the validity of the Class 32 categorical exemption adopted in conjunction with case number ZA-2020-2164-ELD-SPR-1 of January 14, 2021. As a result, city planning staff requested that the Planning and Land Use Committee continue the December 7, 2021 hearing to a later date in order to evaluate and respond to those comments. So this is a, a summary and a summary response to those comments. Um, largely, there are three responses or three um, allegations associated with the overall appeal. Uh, the first, it is alleged that the project relied upon incorrect and unsubstantiated air quality model. The project's air quality assessment fails to adequately evaluate the project's health risk impacts, but the appellant's air quality expert has submitted an analysis indicating a potentially significant air quality impact, and that the appellant's uh, expert indicates the project will result and a potentially significant health risk assessment. If the project results in a significant effect on air quality, it is ineligible for the class 32 categorical exemption. So on review of the appellant's expert argument, it became apparent that there was a fundamental misunderstanding on the part of the appellant's expert on how the applicant's air quality modeling was conducted, leading to their conclusions. To their credit, one of the issues identified did reveal an error in one of the numerical descriptions of the size of the project. On correction of this error and reanalysis, the project still resulted in less than significant impacts. A more thorough response to this issue is detailed in the applicant's technical response to this comment dated uh, January 14, 2022. The second argument, the appellant argues that the noise analysis conducted for the construction phase of the project relied upon the use of a construction noise barrier to reduce the construction related noise impacts on surrounding residential uses. In a later revision of the noise analysis, mention of the construction noise barrier was removed, but the analysis continued to claim credit for its use. Not only is the noise analysis flawed, but use of mitigation measure to reduce the significant noise impact to a less than significant level makes the project ineligible for a class 32 uh, California Environmental Quality Act categorical exemption. So in a memo dated October 23rd, 2020, and contained within the administrative record, the applicant indicated that the use of a temporary sound barrier during construction was found to be a requirement for the proposed project, 
as re regulated by the city's chapter 11 noise regulation, more specifically LAMC section 112.05. As such, explicit mention of the use of the device as a mitigation measure was removed from subsequent analysis, but credit for its use within the air quality model was maintained. Again, a more thorough response to this issue is detailed in the applicant's technical response to this comment dated January 14, 2022. Thirdly, uh, cumulative impacts. Pursuant to CEQA section 15300.2b, the appellant alleges that the categorical exemption is invalid because there are cumulative impacts resulting from this project and those associated with another elder care facility approved at 842 through 847 South Sherborne Drive, also referenced as city planning case number ZA-2019-7715-ELD. Section 2019 So analysis submitted by the applicant dated April 2020 and contained within the administrative record reviewed and considered the potential for cumulative impacts and concluded that the project resulted in less than significant impacts. Both the instant project and the project located at 84, uh, 842 through 847 Sherborne Drive adopted CEQA section 15332 class 32 uh, categorical exemptions for infill development projects as their environmental clearance. Though the appellate alleges that cumulative impacts associated with the development of a two community, I'm sorry, uh, of the two elder care facilities, um, no specific environmental impact is articulated as a result of these alleged cumulative effects of the two projects. And again, a more thorough response to this issue is, is detailed in the applicant's technical response to this comment um, dated January 14, uh, 2022. Um, in conclusion, the Department of City Planning recommends that the appeal be denied and that based upon the whole of the administrative record, find that the project is exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to, to CEQA guidelines, section 15332, class 32, for an infill development project, and that there is no substantial evidence demonstrating that any exceptions contained in section 15300.2 of the state CEQA guidelines regarding location, cumulative impacts, significant effects or unusual circumstances, scenic highways, hazardous waste sites, or historical resources applies. Uh, that concludes staff's report on the matter, and I do remain available to respond to any questions you may have. All right, uh, we have a, a appellant on this item. Surname Paul. Good afternoon. How much time am I going to be given? Three minutes or less. Three minutes or less. Okay, let me set my timer real quick. Okay, good begin. afternoon. My name is Paul. I'm a land use and environmental attorney with Channel Law Group. I'm here today to speak on behalf of Appellant and Holt Partners. Uh, this project is not eligible for a Class 32 exemption because of significant effects related to noise and air quality. I first want to raise a due process objection in response to the expert reports that we prepared and supported the appeal. The applicant prepared an 80-page rebuttal, and the city prepared a supplemental appeal recommendations report. Both of these documents are dated Friday, January 14th. However, it is unclear when these documents were uploaded to the council file management system for public review and consideration. I certainly wasn't provided a copy of these documents. Appellant has not um, had a meaningful opportunity to review this new evidence and present contrary evidence. Under the California law, we are required, uh, we are entitled to a fair hearing. Fair hearing requirements include unbiased reviewers and an opportunity to review the evidence considered by the agency and to be heard. Further, due process, quote, contemplates a meaningful opportunity to present evidence contrary to an appeal and a meaningful consideration of that evidence. This is all the more important because the city takes the position that our hearing today before Plum is the final hearing for the project. Appellants are not generally given another public hearing before city council despite Public Resources Code Section 21151C, which guarantees the right to appeal to the elected decision-making body. 
Finally, you should be aware that a result, as a result of the expert air quality modeling that we submitted in December, the DCP has admitted that, quote, one of the issues identified did reveal an error in one of the numerical descriptions of the size of the project. However, DCP nevertheless concludes that, quote, on correction of this error and reanalysis, the project still results in less than significant impact. So, new air quality modeling has been conducted, but this data was just uploaded to the Council File Management System. And like the fact that we already found one error, doesn't good zoning practice weren't allowing a review and consideration of this new data? That being said, I am able to offer some brief comments on a few issues. Citing LAMC Section 11.2.05, the city claims that the use of noise barriers is a regulatory compliance measure and not a mitigation measure. However, if you look at the section of the code, you will see it's simply a codification of the city's noise ordinance, which was adopted in 1986. The city is trying to conflate a definition for technical infeasibility with a regulatory compliance measure mandating sound barriers. In any event, temporary barriers alone will not provide sufficient shielding to reduce noise levels to less than significant levels. The temporary noise barriers will not shield line of sight of the adjacent residential units located on the second and third floors. The result is that construction noise levels will likely remain significant and potentially unmitigatable. We urge you to continue this matter or we will be our due process rights will be violated. Thank you. All right, now we'll have uh, an applicant, I believe a man named Brady. Hello, this is Andrew Brady from DLA Piper representing the project applicant. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, will I also get three minutes? Yes. Okay, I will go ahead and begin. So, uh, good afternoon, members of PLUM. Uh, first and foremost, we concur with staff's determination of the arguments raised by the appellant lack merit and that this CEQA appeal should be denied uh, this appeal ultimately challenges the city's adoption of a Class 32 CEQA exemption from an 80-room elder care facility that will exclusively serve assisted living and memory care residents. The Class 32 exemption is the CEQA exemption that applies to urban infill development sites, uh, and this project is, is the exact kind of project this exemption is meant to apply to. It is an infill project located on a half-acre site in the urban, fully developed Pico Robertson neighborhood on an R3 multifamily site surrounded by other similarly scaled multifamily buildings. This is an elder care facility serving assisted living and memory care patients. There is no less impactful residential use. The site is square and flat. There's nothing unusual about the building itself and construction would follow a normal process for a building of this size. So this project fits the class 32 CEQA exemption to a T. None of the regulatory exemption, uh, exceptions to categorical exemptions apply as found first by the zoning administrator and affirmed by the Central Area Planning Commission. Uh, as to the arguments, the due process arguments, it, it's kind of rich because this applicant actually submitted hundreds of pages of materials the morning of December 7th, which was the original date uh, scheduled for this, it was continued. Uh, the materials were up on the council file on Friday, uh, which is when they were submitted. So, um, you know, it's incumbent upon the appellant to be checking the council file to be aware. And in any event, this is an invalid due process uh, claim. Um, the, uh, uh, the materials were available and they have the ability to comment on them. It's up to them to do so. Um, here, the applicant concurs with staff. The substantial evidence in the form of expert technical reports supports the city's conclusion that the project qualifies for a class 32 exemption. Uh, the contrary evidence submitted by the applicant is deeply flawed. And under the applicable substantial evidence test, it's legally irrelevant. Uh, we concur with staff that the appeal should be denied. And finally, um, you know, Council District 5 previously requested prior to the December 7th hearing that this matter be ordered to go forth with the Council. Uh, we repeat that request here, which is even more salient now, given the additional delay to this project caused by the appellant's last mid and submittal. Uh, this is an appeal by neighbors who simply don't want a building next door to them. Uh, while we can appreciate those concerns, they do not create CEQA violations. No CEQA violations have been shown here. Uh, there's over 400 pages of expert analysis and record that staff appropriately relied upon uh, and nothing that the appellant has raised uh, 
substantially calls into question those conclusions, including uh, required compliance with the noise ordinance. Everyone has to comply with the noise ordinance. Uh, the, the, their claim to be otherwise lacks merit, uh, and we're here to answer any questions that the uh, commission may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have any comments from Council District 5 on this item? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, Daniel Skolnick, uh, Senior Planner for Council District 5. Uh, we would like to thank the uh, Department of City Planning uh, for doing a very thorough analysis of, of the environmental, and we concur with the recommendation from the AZA. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've heard concurrence uh, from Council District 5. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Mejia, I'll move that we uh, deny this appeal. Uh, if there's no further discussion from the members, I'll ask you to call the roll. Uh, yes, Council Member Harris Dawson. Yes. Council Member Cedillo. Yes. Council Member Blumenfield. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. Uh, that's four votes, and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. All right, now this takes us uh, to our uh, 10th and 11th and final items, items number seven and eight. Uh, Madam City Attorney, I want to get some guidance from you whether we can consider these together and open up public comment on all of them at once. That is item seven, item 8A, and item 8B, or do we have to do it one by one? Uh, how should uh, we proceed in the most efficient way? Perry Kaufman, Macias City Attorney's Office. Um, the, the public comment can be taken together, but the vote has to be um, separate and taken in order. Now, item seven is a request for closed session. It's within the discretion of the committee if they want to go into closed session. If not, that, that would just be a receive and file. On item eight, the first item that has to be considered for your vote is the rescission. If the committee votes to rescind, then it can proceed to um, discuss and vote on uh, item B, which will be a complete new hearing on the historic monument, um, just like we did before, um, but it'll be a complete do-over. All right, uh, so we thank you for that. Uh, we will open up public comment on 7, 8, and 8B, uh, and we will consider them in the order and fashion uh, that the city attorney uh, laid out. And so, um, uh, staff, if you can tell us how many people are on the line for uh, these items. There are five callers, Mr. Chair. All right, so five callers. I think each person gets two minutes each. So we're going to allot 20 minutes to be safe uh, to uh, fully exhaust the complement of callers that we have on the line for items 7, 8A, and 8B. And so we'll open up public public comment now to go no longer than uh, from now until 420. Hello, my name is Debbie Slater. Um, I serve on the uh, Silver Lake neighborhood. Hello? We can hear you. Sorry. Hello, sorry, uh, technical difficulties. I, I just wanted to speak on, on a neighbor here um, living in this community for um, 40 years, roughly. I really feel like this building is important to preserve. It shows a, a uniqueness of our city. I urge this, uh, this committee to please honor the uh, message of the Cultural Heritage Commission and return this to its original standing. Um, please honor the efforts and the importance of this to the city. There is a compromise that can be made in this build. I urge you to, to encourage the builder to do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, caller.
caller with the number ending in 1783, please press star six to unmute yourself. Caller with the number ending in 8070, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Good afternoon, members of PLUM. I'm Rosalind Segarra with the Los Angeles Conservancy, speaking on item 8A and 8B. Today you will decide on an, am on an amended historic cultural monument nomination for Echo Park Tex French Restaurant. Following a proposal by Council Member Mitchell Farrell, the HCM nomination now protects nearly two signs and a bar top. This is not heritage conservation. It is architectural salvage. But this isn't just about text. Fragments and pictures cannot replace real historic places and spaces that tell the story of our past and our future. As currently proposed, text HCM nomination not only undermines the LA Cultural Heritage Commission but single-handedly devalues the city's entire preservation program, which was established in 1962. Whether or not you support saving text, you must oppose this nomination amendment as is and restore the HCM scope to the place, not pieces. Otherwise, the impact will affect us all, as LA's diverse culturally and architecturally significant places stand to be lost. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm a, a resident of Echo Park. <clears throat> I'd like to say that the project for the proposed tech site is making a mockery of LA's historic monument process and laws. It's going to be litigated in the courts and in the press, and this is going to be costly for the city and an embarrassment. A compromise is possible if this committee enables it today. I'd like to appeal to all the Plum members, but in particular, my council member, uh, Mr. Gil Cedillo. Mr. Cedillo, you fought for our neighborhood when Mitch made his attack on El Centro de Pueblo. You're the council member for LA's oldest historic district, Angelina Heights. And your office has been wonderful and supportive. And we're glad we kept you in this redistricting. We're asking you once again to play the adult in the room. If Mitchell Farrell feels he wants to change the cultural heritage law, let him make a proposal through the proper channels. What he's trying to do for the tech developers is shameful and it'll be an expensive disaster for everybody involved. Thank you, Plum Committee members. We're relying on you to do the right thing. Hi, I'm calling from Hollywood. My name is Susanna, and I am calling regarding yet another Cultural Heritage Commission nomination being rejected by this council member. The list just keeps growing and growing and growing. When will you stop turning over our historic resources and putting the control and power in the hands of council members who are funded by the developers who are doing the project? You can save these buildings. They do it in other cities. You could do it here. You can build around them. We have a whole list of RSO uh, units, 80 plus, could have been designated historic that he rejected and other buildings like that around CD13. It has to stop. You have to at some point say our historic resources are important. We can do affordable housing and we can also build. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, Stephen Luffman speaking on items seven and eight. Uh, please support the HCM nomination for tax as it was passed by the Cultural Heritage Commission. Council Member O'Farrell's proposed amendment is dangerous and can have far-reaching consequences. This outrageous amendment would destroy the very resource it seeks to preserve. It would manipulate the Cultural Heritage Ordinance in a way that claims that 
the historic resources being preserved when in fact this amendment will demolish tax. This is clearly not the intent of the Cultural Heritage Ordinance. The Cultural Heritage Ordinance does allow for demolition of designated resources, but only after careful study. Please allow the city's laws to work as designed. Passing this flawed amendment will send a message to developers that they can expect our city council to let them easily demolish our historic resources. Thank you. Caller with the number ending in 8687, please press star 6 to unmute yourself. Oh, hello. My name is Richard Shave. I'm a private citizen, and I'm calling to address agenda items 7 and 8. I'm, I'm asking the Plum Committee to approve the Historic Cultural Mo Monument nomination for Tax Restaurant as it came out of the Cultural Heritage Commission as the individual who landmarked Times Mirror Square and being the first applicant to have the pleasure of a city council member, former city council member, Jose Wizar, rewrite my nomination as it came out of the CHC, I'm, I'm going to ask you not to make that mistake on tax. This is really an egregious abuse of plum and, and really damages the power and the gravity of the Cultural Heritage Commission. Thank you so much. Caller with a number ending in 1783, please press star six to unmute yourself. I see that you've unmuted yourself. You may begin speaking. Caller with the number ending in 1783. Caller with the number 1783. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself. You just asked, hello? Yes, you just asked we can hear you. Me. That's not my number, though. Hello? Yes, you may begin your public comment. Before I do, I just need to notify the, the committee that uh, Daniel Paul has been on hold uh, for a long time with his hand raised to make his three minute presentation on this matter. And uh, there's several other people on hold, but he, he is speaking as the <clears throat> applicant and has been waiting to be called on. Yes, he will be. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, my name is Jen. I'm with the Silver Lake Heritage Trust, the organization who recently took legal action against the city for countless violations of the Brown Act that took place uh, at the previous hearings regarding <clears throat> the tax matter, which is why the city attorney has rescheduled this item today. Um, we believe that, again, the city has violated the Brown Act. There, th th there is no public information regarding uh, the amendments and what the crux of the, today's vote is. We're not even sure the Plum Committee is aware of what the crux of today's vote is because it's not made available on the agenda for the public. That is your time. See. Thank you, Speaker. What, what? Hi, my name is Donald. I'm uh, commenting on agenda items number seven, eight, and nine. 
Uh, I was looking at the Takes restaurant. Um, uh, there's a problem. Uh, the owners of that property, I didn't know that they were going to declare a historical monument to demolish it. Uh, there's a problem with the people over there. They're involved in real estate crimes and other properties around the, over there. I know I have some properties over there. Also, I noticed the City Council Planning Commission approved some CEQA permits on the previous agenda items for property for people that didn't belong to them. Uh, I noticed what you guys did was illegal. Uh, maybe you need to do a little more research or uh, uh, have a little more self-control or uh, something's going on over there. Uh, if you need verification for that, the owner of the property is outside the building with a speakerphone and he's telling you no. There's your verification. Uh, I'm a little worried about declaring that restaurant a uh, historical monument Thank because you, Connor, that's your time. Uh, they're, they're involved in other. Yes. Caller, you've raised your hand. Are you looking to speak? Uh, this is Jen from the Silver Lake Heritage Trust. I believe you cut me off. So I don't know if I can continue. Go ahead, speaker. She's still on the phone. She already spoke. I think she's an appellant. If I'm not mistaken. She's not an appellant. Caller with a number ending in 1783. Please press star six to unmute yourself. I see that you're a muted caller. Please begin your public comment. Hello, my name is Charlie Fisher, and that was not my phone number, but anyway, um, I'm calling because I wrote the original nomination on Tex, and that nomination did not call out for salvage to be it called out for a building. It was approved by the Cultural Heritage Commission as such, and that is the way we went into it. Uh, what they are trying to do with this type of uh, nomination is to create a whole new precedent that was never called out for in the ordinance. We do not nominate salvage. We nominate a building. Um, I'm going to refer to a couple of earlier ones. Angel's Flight years ago when it was dismantled in 1969 when they tried, were getting ready to reassemble it, they actually were looking at doing it as just one of the cars on a post as a monument. Uh, that didn't fly, and they ended up rebuilding Angel's Flight as it was, which is what should have happened. Um, we've had other nominations. Uh, the one in particular, Yimi Lu, which they tried to do essentially some interior parts, and the commission felt that was not the way to do it. Uh, you either nominate the whole business, the whole building, or you don't nominate just a few parts of it. Uh, that is not right either. That's we your have time. success Thank you, speaker. stories. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me. This is Carol Citroni with the Silver Lake Heritage Trust. And uh, here we go again debating the status of our nomination because of this reckless motion that pretends to save text while simultaneously destroying it. This illegitimate amendment serves to facilitate the skirting of CEQA requirements and clears the way for the demolition of the resource itself. 
your approval will not only endorse the false pretense, but work to subvert the law and debilitate the course of every preservation effort in the city. Nothing in the Cultural Heritage Ordinance allows for random features to be salvaged and declared an HCM in a brand new building. This amendment ignores Secretary of Interior standards, disrespects the authority of the CHC, and seeks to dismantle the Cultural Her Heritage Ordinance. It makes a mockery of our law and our preservation community, and please rescind this amendment and approve the nomination as it was passed by the Cultural Heritage Commission. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with a number ending in 1783. Please begin your public comment. Hello. Can yes. you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. My name is Annie Sperling. I'm speaking as an individual, not as a member of the Silver Lake Heritage Trust. My home sits amongst the ruins of garden homes where generations of neighbors have resided, only to find themselves evicted in an absurd rush of misnamed infill in the name of housing, where this housing can only be filled with the very richest members of society. The public has en masse been asking for some form of arbitration, some compromise to preserve our local history in no way asking to stop the city's growth and development. There are endless examples of great compromise where our city's character and history are integrated with growth. Grand Central Market, French Marketplace, Tom Bergen's. Even with 5,000 signatures on a local petition to save Tex, no city elected official would speak to us. Tex was awarded the historic cultural monument nomination, but today Mitch O'Farrell is attempting to rewrite the city's preservation laws. In an unprecedented move is proposing only a bar top and two signs, the winners of this nomination, instead of the actual building. Mitch's staff and the council need to stop their illegal actions and abide by the laws of the city. And make no mistake, the people of this neighborhood who are left with the consequences of these buildings are fighting to preserve the character of this community, even when the elected officials will not. Thank you. We have exhausted our callers list, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much uh, to everyone who has called in on this item. Uh, I know we've had a number of hearings on this uh, matter. So first uh, before us is item number seven, uh, which I'm making a motion that we receive and file uh, per advice of the city attorney. If there's uh, no objection, uh, that'll be the order uh, on that item. Uh, that takes us to item number eight. Uh, and I see Mr. Uh, Bernstein, uh, if you would like to make comments on this matter uh, at this time, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, excuse me, Council Member Harris Dawson. Um, it's my under Terry Cochran Macias city attorney's office it's my understanding that the owner and applicant daniel paul and his attorney alan abscess still have their hands up and they should be given an opportunity to speak speak now Oh, this is now an abscess. Uh, thank you for recognizing me. Um, I represent the Tex family, who are the owners and founders of the Tex restaurant. As the Tex family has documented, Tex restaurant is facing unprecedented challenges to its continued existence. Its physical premises need to change and be modernized if it's to keep alive as a legacy business. Tex family has no objection to the restaurant being designated as a historic cultural monument as long as it doesn't hamper their ability to make the changes needed in order to enable the restaurant to survive. We are very th thankful to the Cultural Heritage Commission. Contrary to what you've heard from some of the people testifying, the commission agreed the restaurant should be allowed to change to meet the challenges facing it. And as you know, the, change, the restaurant has changed again and again over the past century, but it continues as a beloved legacy business. 
We are, we are gratified the commission agreed the historic and cultural significance of the restaurant is not found in its stated building or its interior, but rather in its legacy of continuing operation, hospitality, and its relationship to the community. <clears throat> by adopting the designation recommended by Councilman O'Farrell, you will help to preserve the legacy business, which we believe is all that's important here and which the commission heartily agreed with. Thank you. Daniel Paul, please press star six to unmute yourself. This is Daniel Paul. Uh, I'm representing the applicant. Do I have two or three minutes? You have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, Daniel Paul, architectural historian, uh, representing uh, agenda items seven and, and eight. Uh, there are a couple of substantial issues with, with what uh, CD13 has uh, proposed here. Um, uh, they are, they, it appears that they are confusing this idea of eligibility associated with intangible elements like a legacy business with the possibility that no character defining features need to be preserved. When the Cultural Heritage Commission in their revised findings found text eligible, it was only under criterion one. But even so, under criterion one, the original continental dining design intent is recognized as a character defining feature under criterion one, regardless of a given criterion of eligibility, not just the design criteria, character defining features need to be preserved. And in this case, CAC made it clear that those character defining features are not the bar top and two signs, but it's the continental dining uh, interior. The threshold of integrity for um, uh, criterion consideration, criterion one, is would a historic contemporary recognize the resource from the period of significance? A historical contemporary most likely would not recognize a new condo with a bar top and two signs as the uh, original building. The main character defining feature here includes elements that Mr. Takes, as a legacy family member, himself added through the 90s. The Cultural Heritage Commission acknowledged that later alterations are acceptable. They're done by a legacy family member, and those alterations to the Continental Dining Space that continued the character of the Continental Dining Space are the main character defining feature of this resource. There's a possible sense of overreach here with CD13. Section 122.17110F reads, uh, allow city council to approve or disapprove in whole or in part an application or initiation for a proposed designation of a monument. This is a binary up or down action on what has gone through the ordinance's landmarking process to that point. It does, it's a suspect interpretation to read this language as a full rewrite of something, not a, this is about a proposed designation, not a different designation. Finally, if I have time, I'm quite concerned about this idea of landmarking a legacy business with no true material features associated with it. If the legacy business is the primary historical resource, then if Mr. Takes himself ever ceases the legacy business or never opens it, that could be considered a substantial adverse change under CEQA and Mr. Takes could be held liable. And I'm, and I'm sure that's not the city's intent. But a legacy business, any resource needs to have material features associated with it. And a bar top in two That's your time. Thank you, does not meet that threshold. Thank you. All right. If uh, there are no other uh, parties uh, that we should hear from for the good of the order uh, from the public, uh, we'll ask our own uh, Mr. Bernstein to give a presentation on this item. Thank you, Council Members Ken Bernstein with the Office of Historic Resources. So before you initially is item 8A, which is the rescission of the Council's prior action on this Historic Cultural Monument nomination. So you are to uh, take that up first uh, with a separate vote. And uh, if that vote is in the affirmative, Lambert Giesinger from our staff will present um, the uh, staff recommendation uh, as you rehear the entire matter uh, on its merits uh, anew. All right, uh, thank you. So uh, I'll move that we uh, adopt item 8A, which is uh, to rescind the council's June 2nd action. Uh, Mr. Mejia, can you call the roll on that item? Chair. 
can you just uh, uh, clarify what we're voting on in terms of vote? Are we rescinding? So we made, we made a decision on June 2nd uh, to approve the recommendations of the Cultural Heritage Commission and amend findings of approval and the inclusion of the property located at 1911 through 1929 West Sunset Boulevard and 1910 through 2018 West Reservoir Street, known as Tex French Restaurant as a historical cultural monument. So we're rescinding that and essentially uh, once we, should we rescind that, uh, we will hear this nomination again uh, in item 8B. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Mejia? Uh, yes, I will call the roll. Council Member Harris Dawson? Yes. Council Member Gilbert Cedillo? Council Member Bob Blumenfield? Aye. Council Member John Lee? Aye. Councilwoman Rodriguez? That's three votes and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Okay, so that takes us to 8B. Uh, and uh, we will uh, hear from Department of City Planning on uh, this item, which is a uh, subsequent consideration of this designation. Yes, good afternoon again, Lambert Giesinger with City Planning. Before you today is the recommendation from the Cultural Heritage Commission to designate Tex French Restaurant as an historic cultural monument. Tex French Restaurant was established in 1927 and has been at this current location on Sunset Boulevard in Echo Park since 1962. Over the last 58 years, the building has played an integral role in defining the cultural and commercial identity of the Echo Park neighborhood. And as the longtime location of Tex French Restaurant, it is significant to the commercial history of Los Angeles. Specifically, the commission found that the property exemplifies significant contributions to the broad cultural, economic, and social history of the nation, state, city, and community as the longtime location of Tex French Restaurant, a business that bears a significant association with the commercial identity of Los Angeles. And Ken Bernstein and I are available to answer any questions. All right, uh, we've heard from uh, Department of City Planning on this item. We've heard from the applicant and the uh, appellant. Um, the activist and the owners. We've heard from the public on this uh, a number of times. Uh, is there any discussion from members on this item? All right, uh, seeing no discussion, I'm oh, gonna- um, Terry Coughlin, Macias, I just, I just want- Oh, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, this is Terry Coughlin Macias. I just wanted to point out that the um, the amendment from CD 13 hasn't changed and that's been on the council file since um, December. So there shouldn't be any confusion about what today is all about. There's no new information. Got it. Got it. Say, so with that, uh, I'll move uh, that we approve this in inclusion as amended uh, by Council District 13 back in December. If there's no further uh, discussion on the item, uh, Mr. Mejia, uh, could you call the roll? For some reason, uh, we're not hearing you. I think it's because you're on mute. Uh, sorry. Uh, Councilman Harris Dawson. Yes. Council member Gilbert Cedillo. Yes. Council member Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Council member Lee. And aye. Council, thank you. And Councilwoman Rodriguez. So that's four votes and it carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, can you conclude, Mr. Mejia, that that completes our business for the day? Uh, yes, that concludes our all items on the agenda, Mr. Chair. Excellent. We are adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone.